drug delivery, uh, what are the current drawbacks with conventional systems and why is nanotechnology part of the solution? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, drug delivery is a very important subject for scientists and for engineers and for medical doctors. And the problems that we address are problems that are extremely difficult to solve. Uh, as I will be saying today in my talk later today, that's why we select a mode of work called convergence. Convergence means that scientists from different areas dissimilar areas come together to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. Because it will be naive to think that the solution of the problem of cancer can be achieved by just one discipline, one expertise. In drug delivery, we are combining our knowledge of uh, chemistry, physics, mathematics, pharmaceutical sciences, mm -hmm. medical sciences, with perhaps a little bit of ingenuity, innovation, business acumen, Mm -hmm. and, of course, engineering, in order to come up with improved formulations for patients. Why is that important? We want to improve the quality of life of our patients. Without mentioning any specific disease, I will mention that many uh, patients are used to a particular treatment. Mm -hmm. For example, taking uh, capsules twice or three times a day, or having shots given to them four times a day. Very often, many of the patients cannot really do that themselves. Mm -hmm. They are afraid or whatever. And so we want to develop something new, something different, something original, so that they don't suffer. We question all the time the present modes of delivery. So that's really where, what drug delivery is and where it is going. Especially the last 30 years, mm. it has become an extremely important subject for many scientists. Frankly, if you look at some of the best journals right now in the field, science, which I represent, nature, and so on, you will see many of the papers making comments and this has possible applications in drug delivery. <laughs> this is not that was hap what was happening 30 years ago. However, we live in a world where we as scientists are responsible citizens as well. And we have to ask the question, all these new systems, new products, new medical devices that we develop, how are they going to be passed to the patient? Mm. Who is going to pay for this? And this is a huge problem. And many of us don't appreciate it. And we start with the idea, oh, I will develop this new system and so on. And we don't understand it has to somehow be approved, depending on the country, by the governments, by the company, pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. uh, this formulation over another formulation, and, of course, by the insurance companies or whoever really pays for the products. And then how does uh, nanotechnology offer um, solutions there, perhaps? If we really think how present pharmaceutical systems work, they work mostly at the nano level. Mm -hmm. Yet, what we try to present is, in simple words, tablets, capsules, injections, and so on. So many of us have questioned, can we really redesign our systems so that they are at the same nanoscale, at the same level as the cells, mm -hmm. as the proteins, as what, whatever we're trying to deliver? So nanotechnology has come in and has really given a new optic, a new view of how we can solve a problem. Instead of simply delivering a drug, say by an injection, you try to find a way to target it, yeah. to present it directly to the cells that hopefully uh, are responsible for a particular disease. So it's really a very natural uh, problem. Does it work? You can ask me or I can answer right now. It works in some cases, not yet in other cases. So there are some uh, 
some people that are more questioning, really, the implications and the impact of nanotechnology in our field. I'm always optimistic. Mm -hmm. And I'm optimistic because I work for the patients. And I do not want to come to governments and give them an advice to stop supporting nanotechnology without really being 100% sure that we cannot get something better. And for the time being, I believe we can get better products, better devices, better systems if we work with nanotechnology. Right. And um, one of your areas of research is type 1 diabetes. Why does the de delivery of insulin into the body pose so many challenges currently? Insulin is a very important therapeutic agent that has to be delivered to type 1 diabetic patients and sometimes to type 2. It is a protein. It is a relatively sensitive protein that works only in specific pH environments, mm -hmm. only, of course, in specific temperatures, only under specific conditions. What would be a simple way of delivering insulin if it were not injection? It would be swallowing insulin. But if you swallow insulin, it can be destroyed already in the saliva, in the esophagus, and so on. So the question becomes, if we want to get better methods of formulation and delivery of insulin for type 1 diabetic patients, we have to bypass some of the problems that we have with the standard formulations and deliver the insulin intact in the blood because mm -hmm. that's where it's going to work. For the last 40 years, that has been the major effort of our group and other groups, many other groups, to come up with systems that can deliver insulin that way. It's an extremely sensitive proteinic protein molecule. It changes very easily. You can have change in the amino acids in it and so on, and that may affect the so-called pharmacological impact, a pharmacological bioavailability in the systems. So this is really why we are looking at new methods very carefully, and we are always trying to improve uh, the delivery of insulin in type 1 diabetic patients. Improvement means a high content of insulin Being intact, mm -hmm. intact, high quality, and at the same time, lower pain, if I may use that word, for the patients than the present formulations. Otherwise, a patient would not be using that new system. Mm -hmm. um, and how does your work apply to multiple sclerosis? And I'm, I'm aware there's okay. also a personal dimension there as well. Oh, you happen to know about the personal <laughs> dimension, and I don't mind sharing it with your, uh, uh, with your listeners. And uh, Basically... Multiple sclerosis is a very important autoimmune disease. We still do not know 100% why our body attacks the myelin. The myelin is a sheath that covers the nerves. Mm -hmm. Once it's attacked, it forms something that I would call lesions, plaques. Some countries will call it, some different languages will call it plaques. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, basically, there are ways with magnetic resonance imaging MRI to see that the patient has already been uh, affected by the early stages of that disease. So several questions. Mm -hmm. First, can we deliver a drug that will delay, not entirely stop for the time being, delay the arrival to disability? Because everybody who listens to us today has to appreciate if the nerves have those lesions, they become less flexible. That affects vision. It affects other functions of the body. Right. People may become uh, impotent or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or they may be incontinent and so on. So basically, what we're trying to do is find ways to deliver some of these drugs without the detrimental effects of the present formulations. One of the most successful formulations is based on interferon beta, which is a protein, and that interferon beta has to be given intramuscularly. That means straight down the muscles. So I always think of divine intervention because in Christmas of 1992, 
I started having some signs, double vision, that a few weeks later were diagnosed as multiple sclerosis. Mm. At that time, I had developed the first carriers, the first systems for delivery of insulin, now the protein, different behavior, different system, different pH region, different characteristics. But the idea was already there. And after I was stabilized taking a particular drug called interferon beta, intramuscularly, once a week, I started working on different methods of development, of delivery of such uh, systems, uh, therapeutic agents. And in fact, I will talk about it this afternoon. I don't hide it. Uh, it's a very interesting problem, and I'm glad you asked me. If I have one minute of your time, of uh, people that suffer from multiple sclerosis and take intramuscular delivery, because now there are a few other delivery methods that have come out the last few years, uh, they have to be careful, uh, take the delivery, as I said, by injection. How many of us can do shots of ourselves intramuscularly? And it's not, it's not like the shots for insulin, okay? And the second thing is, uh, you know, they have to take intramuscularly, and then there are side effects. Mm. The next 24 hours, there is a certain weakness, and uh, don't forget interferon has effects uh, on uh, our, our health, especially uh, psychological effects. Well, you you right. have depression, uh, typically, mm -hmm. and so on. So, uh, and then you travel. <laughs> you go to another country. You have to carry with you an ins a, a protein, mm -hmm. all these things. And we started working, and uh, I think we have now some extremely successful results of an oral delivery system right. for interferon beta which is now in clinical studies and so on. We will see when it will come out. But this is one of the many applications where I truly, truly believe we will help patients because patients are looking for something better. Parenthetically, since the listeners and everybody following me today are wondering what happened in my case, 12 years later, it was discovered that I had been misdiagnosed. <laughs> so for 12 years, I was taking a drug that I didn't have to take. It was another autoimmune disease, which is easy to correct and so on or to control. But anyhow, as I said, sometimes one thinks perhaps divine intervention <laughs> has come in there. Um, and uh, was that the, the pivotal eureka moment that made you choose this particular field, or is it earlier than that, would you oh, say? Oh, much earlier than <laughs> that. I come originally from Greece. I was educated as a chemical engineer in Greece uh, 50 years ago or 52 years ago. I was a sophomore, and I had returned for home very late from classes and so on. And I turned on the radio. We had no television at that time. It was December of 1967. And I heard that some doctor at the Grotesur Hospital in Cape Town in South Africa had come up with the first heart uh, transplant. Yeah. And it was shocking. Here is a chemical engineer who was working with oil and gas. I was working for Shell in the summers in Rotterdam suddenly having to face the reality that there were other new subjects that chemical engineers could study because passing blood through the heart is, of course, a transport phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It is a fluid mechanics phenomenon, except with a much more complex fluid. And I got very excited. I went to libraries. I started looking. I decided to go to the United States to study as a PhD, biomedical engineering, and I went to MIT in 1971. And that was really the Eureka moment, or the Eureka period for me, because at that time, I realized how important it was for engineers to contribute to the medical field. We're not medical doctors. No. We listen to the medical doctors, we appreciate the problems that they have, and we try to solve them. The actual Eureka moment for me was a very unusual event at MIT 
you know how you work. The same thing that happens here at Kaust, that you have an incredible number of first-rate scientists, and you have the ability to interact with each other. It was the same way at MIT in the early 70s. And one of my best friends and colleagues and classmates was somebody called Robert Langer. Langer, MIT, who is, I consider him to be probably the number one name in biomedicine in the world right now. And Bob Langer and I started talking, and it was in 1973 that we first exchanged over dinner in a delicatessen <laughs> in Boylston Street in Boston the idea that maybe we can solve the uh, problems in the world by coming up with a new drug delivery systems. And that's what led <laughs> to what 50 years later is what we have done in the field. And, and today, do you see yourself as an engineer, a pharmaceutical scientist, an inventor, uh, all of those things? I feel myself first and foremost as an educator who educates the young generations to think, to be careful, to control uh, their output by helping people first and foremost. Whether these people are young students or faculty members and so on, teach people how to think. Teach them what are the important phenomena and the important problems. Number two, not necessarily as an inventor, as a somebody who tries to help people. And I do that with my knowledge. And sometimes my knowledge is not the best. I require the knowledge of other individuals as well. But that's really what drives me. I want to solve before I retire. I want to solve the problem of Crohn's disease, which is another autoimmune disease that affects many people mm. and which is extremely difficult to control because we simply don't understand yet how certain cells become crone uh, sensitive and so on. So that's really what drives me. I'm a scientist. In fact, there are talks where I will speak 100% about uh, science, scientific, no applications. But in the long run, I understand who pays for our work. The work is paid for by the people, mm. by the citizens. I cannot go to the citizen of Saudi Arabia, or United States, or European citizens and say, you pay my salary, my laboratory, my activities, and so on, so that I can write papers, so that I can get awards, so that I can become an academician. That's wrong. Mm. And those who think that way, I think they have to really realize that we live in a society that changed, that has changed. So what drives me is helping people. What drives me is educating the new generations. What drives me is, of course, doing fundamental work and checking it before I publish it and so on, before I present it to you this afternoon. Uh, it's a combination of the three. And a uh, f final question on, on, on that, that bit, the interrelation with, with people. Um, what does it bring to your work, the, f the fact that you interact with the patients who are the recipients of your work? Oh, it brings so much, you cannot imagine. Because you are in an office, you are in a laboratory, you design something new, you know the field very well, but when you see in the eyes of the patient the satisfaction, the freedom, it's something incredible. If I may, uh, about... 15, 17, no, 20 years ago, we started working with a major uh, company that was developing intraocular lenses, lenses for cataract. Mm -hmm. And at some stage in this development, I was able to be in the presence of some of the patients who had just been uh, given my new lenses. And there they had removed the bandages that's 20 25 years ago so things are a little bit different now and this was the 72 75 year old lady and she was elated and they told her the inventor was close by she came to me she grabbed my hands and said my boy you saved my life i can see my grandchildren again i can see my granddaughter uh getting married and so on and you know, 
I don't want to get <laughs> very emotional now. But you know, that moment you realize what you do. It's not the awards. It's not the academies. It's nothing. It's not being at Caust or being at the University of Texas. It's helping these people. And uh, so that's really what continues driving us. <laughs> Great. I think that's a, a, the perfect place to stop. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you.